Societies around the world punish people for deviant or bad behavior. But the punishment is often mitigated by the context. Judges, juries, even everyday people give credence to the context within which that deviant behavior happens. But why? Isn't the deviant behavior bad in itself? The harm that is caused by it is still real, regardless of the context. Shouldn't people be held accountable for the actions that they did, held responsible for the actions that they chose to do. So what is it about the context that changes how we perceive these transgressions? Is it because we realize at some level that our behavior isn't fully in our control, that context matters? And that leads to the question, can you create a context where people will do bad things even if it's not who they are on a daily basis. Can the situation override our everyday sense of what's right and wrong? And on the other hand, can we create a context where people will rise above what we consider normal, everyday behavior? That's the topic of our episode today. So the Sanford Prison Experiment was designed to show how situations matter. When you put good people in an inherently bad, corrupt situations, uh, many of them, good apples, will turn to, into bad apples. But what, what then I added, what I realized later on, is that we have to focus on who makes the bad barrels. And that's the key. That is the voice of Dr. Philip Zimbardo, talking about one of the most famous and controversial studies in social psychology, the Stanford Prison Experiment. This study, along with Solomon's Ashes' work on conformity and Stanley Milgram's work on obedience, changed how we understand deviant, bad, or negative behavior. It highlighted that the situation or the context that we are in can corrupt us and turn us from being good apples into bad apples. The concept of context is a recurring theme throughout this interview. Context can, as described by Dr. Zimbardo, make a good person do horrific things. But there's another side to this story about how context can lead us to do better outcomes and possibly even heroic acts. Understanding who is creating the barrels, as Dr. Zimbardo notes, is key. Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim. We explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners to bring those insights to you. This is a very special episode. Dr. Philip Zimbardo is one of the most celebrated psychologists of the modern era. His work had a significant impact, not just on the academic world, but in the general population as well. The Stanford Prison Experiment has been detailed in almost every Psych 101 course for the past 40 years, written about in popular magazines and newspaper articles, talked about on many, many, many TV shows, and it even had a movie or two made about it. August 14th, 2021 is the 50th anniversary of that infamous experiment, and we were honored to have Dr. Z, as he asked us to call him, on the show to talk about it. Not only talk about that, but also on the implications of this in the real world and on the work that he has mostly focused on for the past 10 years, which is the Heroic Imagination Project. One thing that shines brightly throughout our conversation with him is that he still has the curiosity of a child. He made it clear that his entire life has focused on learning. I guess, I mean, I am now 88, getting ready to retire. Uh, and but but I'm I mean, I'm still a kid. I mean I still have the the wonder of life, the the joy of learning. To think that at 88 he is just now getting ready to retire is pretty freaking <laughs> amazing. If you ask me to, it, I agree, Kurt. And his story is equally amazing. Let's begin with learning about how the kid Phil Zimbardo, growing up poor in the 1940s in a mostly Puerto Rican neighborhood in Bronx became Dr. Z, world-famous psychologist. What were some of the aspects of his childhood that formed the man that he became? Here is how he described that part of his childhood. Not only did we grow up in poverty in the South Bronx ghetto, my parents were a second-generation immigrants who didn't finish elementary school. 
maybe my mother finished sixth grade. My father uh, was uh, thrown out of school in the third grade for, you know, for being disruptive. So, so my parents, we never had a book in the, in the house. My, my father would do odd jobs. His family were barbers by trade. Uh, he thought that was like being somebody's servant or body, body person. Uh, but he was he was brilliant, uneducated, really t- totally uneducated, but uh, had an incredible mind for technology. Uh, and literally in 1948, he built a, a, a television set from a di- wiring diagram, uh, w- helped worked out with the radio store man who lived who lived in our building. Television was invented in 1947. We, had, we, had, we literally had the first television in, certainly in the Bronx, maybe more. And it was an eight inch green screen. Uh, but we, we, again, we, I remember we watched the World Series. I charged my friends a quarter, you know. <laughs> Charging his friends a quarter to watch the World Series? <laughs> Definitely a bit of an insight into how he operated even back then. But beyond just getting by and surviving, he realized he needed to be educated to become something other than someone who would survive by just doing odd jobs like his father. But it was clear to me education was the key, that his education was the key out of poverty, was the key out of being lower class, being uneducated. Uh, The idea of getting a library card that you'd go and they give you four books to take home for a month, you know. It was astounding. That library card must have helped him a lot. He graduated from the James Monroe High School in the Bronx. By the way, it was the same school that produced a New York congressman, Jacob Gilbert, an early researcher of neutrinos, Leon Lederman, Danny Aiello, the actor best known for movies like Moonstruck and Once Upon a Time in America. And another notable grad happened to be the groundbreaking psychologist, Stanley Milgram. Wait, wait, so... So he and Stanley Milgram of the famed Obedience Shock Studies attended the same high school. So what time was this at the same time? What was going on there, Tim? Kurt, man, they were even in the same class. And here's how Dr. Z talks about it. I should mention Stanley Milgram and Phil Zimbardo were in the same class at James Monroe High School in the Bronx, 1948, 49, 50. He was the brilliant kid. I mean, he won all the medals at graduation, and uh, he was just this little, he was really tiny, short kid, but he was intense. You know, when you're in high school, all you want to have is a date for the weekend. You know, the prettiest girl in the class to ask her out for, to go, go, to, go to the movies, go to Lowy's Paradise, or whatever it was, Ace Theater, Prosper Theater, all these theaters in the Bronx. And it was amazing also that there was a theaters on every few blo- every few blocks because people lived lived in the movies before TV. And and a Saturday was all day. I mean, there were there were cartoons, there were movie tone news for 20 minutes, there were there were two main features, and you go and you you you'd bring lunch, you bring a sandwich or something, and you, you spend the whole day. That's what that's what every kid did on Saturday. You went to the Saturday movies. But Mil but Milgram was concerned about the power of the situation. He's now an 18 year old high school kid. And because it's not that far from the second world war and he's Jewish and he's, he's, he's saying, you know, in, in discussion groups, you know, how, how likely it is that me and my family would end up in a concentration camp. We'd say, what, you know, he, he, he were trying to get a date for the weekend and he's talking about, you know, I mean, so he was a serious kid, and and we'd say, Stanley, we're not that kind of people. We're not like those Germans. And he, and then I still can. It rings in my ears. How do you know what you would do until you're in the same situation? I'll bet the Nazi youth thought the same thing at the beginning. That you know, we are we are we are good Germans. You know, we're not we're not like the bad Germans. You know, until suddenly they were you know saluting Hitler and arresting Jews and and yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, making Jews wear a star of David uh, to, to signal them out, and and then all the horrible things that that followed. Um, so he, here was this the embryo of of the Stanley Milgo with blind obedience to authority, and essentially. But his thing is really the blind obedience 
of, of Nazi civilians to Hitler, uh, to uh, the, the Hitler command. Uh, is a forerunner of this in 1949, and we graduated in 1950 uh, in, in James Monroe High School in the Bronx. Wow. Just, just, just wow. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's just crazy. I mean, for Phil to be able to say, I went to high school with Stanley Milgram is pretty cool. But I'll bet Stanley yep. Milgram also said, I went to high school with Phil Zimbardo. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that, that, you're probably right. You're probably right. It's, it's pretty crazy. Okay. But Philip graduates with Stanley and then goes on to complete his BA with a triple major in psychology, sociology, and anthropology from Brooklyn College in 1954. And he graduated summa cum laude. And while he had applied to many graduate schools, the one he really wanted to get into was the only one that hadn't gotten back to him for a very interesting, albeit disturbing reason. Remember, this is 1954. Let's hear how Dr. Z explains it. But I didn't hear from Yale University, which is where I wanted to go because it was it was near it was near the Bronx where we lived. It was a, sh a short a short train ride or car ride away, and it turns out that I was neither accepted nor rejected nor put on a waiting list. I was I was uh, I, I just had a question mark, and the reason was that some of the faculty because of a set of circumstances in my, in my application, assumed that I was black. And if I was black, there was no way I would make it uh, in the graduate program at, at Yale University, because in fact, they had never had a black student ever. So Tim, why did they think that Philip was black? Black. Well, they weren't sure if he was or not. Later, he got to see the list of applicants, and there was a big question mark by his name. And in talking with some of the faculty at Yale, the question mark was there for several reasons. Uh, the neighborhood that he grew up in, his role as the secretary of the local NAACP chapter, and because his first published paper as an undergraduate explored the dynamics of prejudice between Blacks and Puerto Ricans in the Bronx. He even wrote on his application that his hero was Charlie Parker, the great jazz saxophonist. All of these things kind of left the committee wondering. But they let him in eventually. Yeah, yeah, they did let him in. Apparently, a student who had been accepted at Yale backed out to go to the University of Minnesota, which is ironic since Phil was making plans to go to the University of Minnesota after not hearing back from Yale. So <laughs> Philip Zimbardo might have been a University of Minnesota alum? except for the fact that another student canceled out a mess that think about that. He could have been a gopher. Oh my gosh. A local boy. I know it would have been cool, but here's how he described his breakfast meeting with Casey Montgomery, the groundbreaking behavioral neuroscientist from Yale who would become his first graduate school mentor. And so literally this guy K. Montgomery said, uh, I called me and said, uh, have you decided where you're going to go? I said, yeah, I'm going to go to University of Minnesota, work with Stanley Schachter, uh, who's there. And he said, well, if you haven't made a decision, wait, I, I want to meet you tomorrow. So we met, there was the Eastern Psychological Association was meeting in New York. And we, we met at, at, at the hotel and 10 o'clock in the morning. He's already had, you know, two martinis. Couldn't believe it. And, uh, and then he said, okay, do you know how to run rats? And I said, sure. You know, you get a broom. <laughs> and he said, do you know how to build equipment? I said, sure, because my father was very handy. And he said, okay, can you start, can you start uh, working this summer? Not that way till September. I said, sure, I'm unemployed. He said, okay, I'm, I'm now offering you a position as my graduate assistant at Yale University. This is your stipend. And that was it. Again, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Crazy, right? So, so that is how Dr. Z got into Yale. The idea that even in the 1950s, in the psychology department mm -hmm. at Yale, mm -hmm. that there was such racism and blatant stereotyping just seems unreal in this day and age. It just doesn't seem that it could even happen. It wasn't that long ago. Hey folks, Tim here. Upon further reflection and conversation with Mary, Kurtz and my trusted research partner, we have some additional thoughts on this. Kurtz and my initial comments came from who we are, white, male, and privileged. 
And there is certainly a portion of our listeners who are not white or male or privileged and will not be surprised by this. Yes, the events we're discussing happened to Dr. Z 15 years before Yale even admitted women into its student body. So we can't underestimate the context. However, this sort of profiling can happen and is still happening today. Check out our discussion with Nurit Nobel in episode 76 for more on how hiring practices can run askew in the 21st century. A special thanks to Mary for the much-needed perspective. And now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. And I think, obviously, that had to have some influence in how he looked out at the world and the research that he subsequently did. Yeah, I mean, he grew up poor in a mixed neighborhood, and he was comfortable with people who were different from him. The idea that he was potentially seen as black because of some assumed attributes he had, I got to agree with you, Kurt, that this probably ended up shaping his worldview. Also, you have to wonder how much his early association with Stanley Milgram shaped some of his thinking, or at least shaped what research he was paying attention to in his early career. Oh, yeah. So, so true. Absolutely. Okay, so Zimbardo graduated Yale. Then he went on and he taught at the New York University College of Arts and Science, then on to Columbia, before moving on to Stanford in 1968. So prior to 1971, much of his work focused on the cognitive control of motivation. Then in 1971, he formulated the idea for the Stanford prison experiment. But since so much of this is about context, Let's listen to how Dr. Z described life on a college campus back in 1971. Now, um, again, during during the 60s, during anti, 70s, anti-war, uh, anti-Vietnam War activities, uh, in many universities, students were protesting. I was actually leading protests. And the administration called the police on the campus to, to quell the student public protest. Uh, and in many cases, students got beaten up and and resist, and they some of them got arrested, and they, it's even worse resisting arrest. Okay, so he was leading some of the protests, <laughs> right. which is which is another window into who this person is. Yeah. And I think importantly for the study, though, this shows that the students were well aware of the way so-called criminals were treated at the time. Tim, can you lay out the general basis for how the study was set up? Sure, sure. So they put an ad in the local newspaper. Male college students needed for psychological study of prison life. $15 per day. There were 70 respondents, of which 24 were chosen as psychologically healthy college-age boys. They set up for a two-week study in the basement of Jordan Hall on Stanford's campus, and the participants were randomly assigned to guard or prisoner by just a flip of a coin, or they did it in front of everybody. On a Sunday morning, the day before the experiment started, the prisoners were rounded up by actual local police, arrested, handcuffed, put in squad cars, and booked like regular criminals with fingerprints and mugshots. They were even strip searched. Then they were blindfolded and transferred to the basement of Jordan Hall, where they were forced to wear smocks and stocking caps. Prisoners were addressed by their prison numbers and put in ankle chains. Guards were given uniforms and mirrored glasses and wooden batons like billy sticks. And the guards worked around the clock in eight-hour shifts while the prisoners were in cells continuously. Zimbardo himself would act as the prison warden. What Dr. Z was trying to understand was rooted in Milgram's comments about the Germans. Would it be possible to influence the behaviors of otherwise good, mentally healthy, college-age boys simply by putting them in a bad situation? Milgram's experiments had shown that when pushed to do horrific things, a majority of people would comply with those requests by authority figures. What the prison experiment was looking at differed. It was looking to see if the situation itself could corrupt people and produce those evil behaviors. So the Stanford prison experiment was was designed to show how situations matter. When you put good people in in inherently bad, corrupt situations, many of them, good apples, will turn into bad apples. 
But what, what then I added, what I realized later on is that we have to focus on who makes the bad barrels. And that's the key. The experiment started on August 14th, 1971, and it was intended to run for two weeks. Yeah, but after only a day and a half, one of the young men who was in the prisoner role had to be released because he was so distressed. He was replaced by an alternate. And participants in the guard role began to treat the participants in prisoner roles with little regard for their humanity. The young men were taking their roles extremely seriously. The guards put uncooperative prisoners in solitary confinement and took privileges away, such as the ability to sleep under blankets. It was a brutal week at Stanford. And finally, on August 20th, only six days into this so-called two-week experiment, Dr. Z ended it. Those, those situations, you know, not only bring, it's not that they bring out the worst in people, they put the worst into people. Uh, and, and so that's what the prison study showed, that is putting good, intelligent college students, American college students, into a situation where some had total power over others and, 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 and some um, had no power at all, that here's where we saw it. not only did power corrupt, but power corrupted creatively, inventively. Power corrupted creatively, inventively. We often fail to give consideration to the complexity of the human condition and how amazing we can be. And all of that power that can be channeled into building spacecrafts that carry humans can also be used for horrible, horrific acts of terror. And this was done by students who, according to every outside measure, were good kids and psychologically sound. Dr. Z embellished on the random nature of how guards became guards. They all signed in informed consent. They all knew that, that there would be random assignment to prison and guard. And they, they knew that by a flip of the coin, virtually they could be in the other role, but it didn't matter. Once, once they had on the uniform, once they had the, this position of power, then they started abusing it and abusing it in ever more creative ways. Dr. Z talked specifically about one of the guard participants, a freshman from Chapman College named David Eshelman. He said, he said later on, he was interviewed, he said, I felt like I was a puppeteer and the prisoners were my puppets. And by, by going like this, I could make them do things. That's the ultimate dehumanization. I mean, you know that you are not a real guard. You know it's not a real prison. You know these are not real prisoners. They didn't do anything to deserve to be in prison except to answer an ad to say students want to study a prison life. But nevertheless, you cross that line and you start acting and you become the actor. This is an interesting idea. This idea that you start to play a part, that the part you play is determined by our shared understanding of what that part is. And you lose yourself to the role that you play. The part where David talks about being a puppeteer, being a puppeteer of humans. It's an interesting as it begs the question, was this a real experiment that showed how the situation influenced people? Or was it that the participants were trying to figure out what the experimenters wanted and going and doing behaviors to satisfy that? This is some of the criticism that has been given to the study. David, in another interview, goes so far as to say that he thought that this, this type of behavior was what the researchers were looking for. He talked about who would want to be bored for two weeks. Yeah. But there's another interesting thing going on here, that the actions that David took were horrible, that even if he is playing a role that he thought the experimenters wanted him to play, his behavior is being driven by the situation, by the environment. Yeah. Again, it might be more of a Stanley Milgram piece, but it is being changed. His behavior is being influenced by the situation that he is in. And another piece of the puzzle was that nobody stopped him or questioned right. that behavior. Right. The idea that all of the guards played their part and didn't raise a white flag on this and say, whoa, <laughs> Nelly, this has gone too far. What the hell are we doing? Right? I mean, they stripped 
prisoners naked, deprived them of sleep, made them use plastic buckets instead of toilets. None of the other guards protested. In fact, in fact, they joined in. Yeah. And the idea that almost all prisoners responded with subdued approach or a rebellion, there was a little rebellion that happened, but they didn't just walk out of the experiment, which they could have. This was a voluntary experiment, but they stayed on. And the prisoners' mindsets were such that they took the abuse while the guards' mindsets were about delivering the abuse or at least allowing that abuse to be delivered. You know, it's interesting to note that the study was canceled early because Dr. Z's girlfriend at the time, who eventually became his wife, came to see what was going on. She saw what was happening as someone who was on the outside, and she shed a light on the situation that even Zimbardo himself hadn't realized. He himself was caught up in the situation. It seemed like everybody involved in the experiment was caught up in the world that they had just created. So the situation, Tim, you're saying, even corrupted the person who put the situation together? <laughs> yeah. yeah, how about that? All right. So there has been a lot of recent pushback on the study, and some of it is warranted. It was a small sample size. So again, broad generalizations that were made from this, which there were many, are really suspect. There wasn't a control group. Another no-no. So this wasn't a real experiment. It was more of a demonstration. But like Richard Nisbet said in our interview with him, there is an existence of proof with this, that it happened at this time with these people and with this outcome. Is it repeatable? We don't know. Ethics and IRB boards have not authorized this type of study again, as far as we know. But the study did happen. It's an existence of proof, and it gives us a data point to explore and think about how the environment, how the context that we are placed in influences our behavior for good or evil. Which leads us to a situation that happened more than 30 years after the SPE, the Iraqi War, and what happened at Abu Ghraib prison, which was an experiment of its own kind. What was spooky about this, Tim, is that when I saw the pictures from when the story broke back in the early 2000s, the first thing I thought of was how similar this all felt to what Zimbardo had done with the Stanford prison experiment. <laughs> wow. The way that the guards dehumanized the prisoners, the inventive ways they found to torture them, it was eerily reminiscent of what had happened back in 1971, just at a much more horrible scale. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. Dr. Z told us the story of Chip Frederick, the sergeant in charge of the night shift at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Atrocities were revealed by the media in 2004, and Chip was prosecuted in a, in a court martial. Dr. Z had actually been brought in as an expert witness, and he got to see all the pictures, one of the very few people in the world to do this. Dr. Z testified that, yes, Chip Frederick allowed these things to go on, but at its core, at his core, Chip was not an evil person. I, I mean, interview family, friends, his teachers, uh, his Boy Scout leader, um, uh, his, his wife, and then I actually had him spend two days with me in San Francisco. So I get, get to know this person in person. Now, he felt uh, incredible guilt. He said, I'm guilty for what I did. There's no question about it. I, and I should have, I should have not have participated. I should have blown the whistle. I was in charge. I should have prevented others from doing it. But he said, I just got caught up in the situation. Caught up in the situation. Just like the guards at Stanford. Mm -hmm. This was reminiscent of this all over again. And yet, Chip was convicted and served four years in prison along with more than a dozen of his military colleagues. And probably rightfully so. Again, going back to the beginning of what we talked about in this episode, does the deviant behavior, does the punishment need to be mitigated because of the circumstances? And how much does that happen? Right? But shortly after the trials, Dr. Z wrote an article called you can't be a sweet cucumber in a vinegar barrel. Yeah. And that idea, that idea that the system, that if you are a sweet cucumber, you will turn to a bad 
pickle, I guess, right? Is that what, <laughs> what it turns into, right? You'll turn into a bad pickle if you're put into that vinegar barrel. And that evil is created not necessarily by some internal factor within these people, but it's created by the situation that they're placed in yeah. and the expectations that they are placed upon them. Yeah. Well, and this got Zimbardo thinking, right? If you can create evil behavior, can you cultivate heroic behavior as well? It was a novel idea. And with a number of researchers, including Zeno Franco, Dr. Z started the Heroic Imagination Project. Dr. Z said in a TED Talk, his mission in life is to, quote, seed the world with heroes, unquote. The mission of the Heroic Imagination Project is to provide training to individuals and groups on how to become a hero. They believe that while everyone can be coerced into conducting evil acts, the opposite is also true. And that, quote, each and every seemingly ordinary person on this planet is capable of committing heroic acts, yeah. unquote. Yeah, yeah, very cool. This is how Dr. Z described it. Oh, yes. I think I think to be heroic uh, uh, should not be an accidental event. It, uh, it sh- you should be a, a hero in training. That, in fact, that's our program, to be a hero in training so that when the moment comes, and for most of us, it never comes. So, I, so I'm talking about... A spe- a hero in action that there's some event that happens that you intercede to help someone. Uh, it's a nonprofit in, in San Francisco. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's mission is uh, to create less uh, uh, psycho- social psychological lessons that help train youth and others how to act heroically when the occasion arises. And sometimes it's stand up, speak out, take action in challenging situations in your life, if and when it happens. So, so you're a hero in waiting. You, so you're an ordinary person. So you don't become a heroic person until the moment arises for you to take action. And then the question is, do you take, do you take not only action, but why is it appropriate? So the Heroic Imagination Project has been around for over 10 years now. It has trained thousands of people. It is literally creating heroes in waiting that if we are trained properly, that if and when a moment arises that we act in a heroic way as opposed to an evil way or more likely just by not taking any action at all. He said that being a hero does not always involve big acts. And I thought that was a really good reminder. It might just be confronting your racist uncle at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> or your or your racist aunt, you know? I mean, you know, that, that's crazy. But yeah, it's those small acts. And he said, you know, what's really even more important with this training is he said that, look, it's not just about confronting that racist person at Thanksgiving. It's about thinking about this and maybe acting before Thanksgiving mm. and doing it in a way that is positive but firm. And best of all, get others to join in with you and help you. Yeah, a little social proof. Not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Huh? Well, the Heroic Imagination Project has a concept of the four Ds that they teach. And just wanted to quickly go through those. Uh, the first is to democratize. Anybody can be a hero, right? Anybody. And the second is to demystify. Most heroes are just everyday people, and that, that's totally great. And the, the third is to diffuse, not to focus on solo heroes, because it's easier to be a group hero, actually, and apply these influence skills. And then the fourth one is to declare, to make a commitment to be a hero in training and, and in waiting. I love the idea that Dr. Z that after seeing the evil that can manifest itself in people in all these different situations is dedicating the final years of his life to elevating the good and the heroic in people to seed the world with heroes, as he says. So listeners, think about this. We are all heroes in waiting. 
everyday people like you and me and maybe even Tim. Uh, what? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> we, we can make a commitment to doing the right thing. Begin to imagine what it means to be a hero in our daily lives, to be a hero in your daily life. Oh, that's such a great thought. Dr. Z had one other point to make. We started to talk about the recent police killings that have happened to black men around the U.S. especially. He offered this up to any police force that's willing to take him up on it, hopefully to change the system and thereby change context and to create a better policing environment. It's not clear to me, but I know that what we do need is uh, a new kind of heroic training program uh, in social psychology about bystander effect, about implicit bias, about um, mindset, how we are influenced by our mindset in positive or negative ways. Um, and and, and I, I, would love to, I would love to actually work with police educational programs to, to put our material in, you know, and we would do it for obviously for free. With that, Tim, I think we should start to wrap this up. Agreed. That sounds good. It was a true thrill and pleasure to have Dr. Zimbardo on the show. He truly is a legend in this field, and his story is both fascinating and enlightening. His work on the dehumanizing aspects of situations is what most people know him for. But he has also done some great research on shyness, cult behavior, time perception, and of course, heroism, as we know. He was also the president of the American Psychological Association in 2002. Dr. Z definitely has been influential in the world of psychology and social psychology, and I would say in the world in general. And it was a honor to have him on this show. Truly, truly. A couple of takeaways from the conversation. First, a bad barrel can take a good apple and make it bad. Yeah, it, you know, often our behaviors are influenced in ways beyond our conscious mind. And our behaviors are influenced by the situation that we are in. If we want to improve our life, we need to be hyper vigilant, take notice of how we behave in different environments. We need to be intentional and to consciously decide how we want to behave. It is hard, but we need to become more aware of what is going on and how we are responding to that. Whether it is the corporate culture that we work in, the expectations of our boss or the CEO, or it could be the group of friends that, that we hang out with and their tendency maybe to make fun of a certain group of people. And are you going to go along with it, even though you would never do that anywhere else or with any other people? It's hard, but it is something that we can do and it's something that we all need to do. Yeah. Second, and I just love this. We are all heroes in waiting. We are all, except for maybe you or me. I don't know. There's a 50% chance that one of us isn't a hero in waiting. We're just crazy evil guys. We don't have any, but... we don't have any base rate data on this yet. So, let's, <laughs> but I can, I can no, actually, I think, I think Tim, if we try, if we really, really, really try, we might be able to do this, right? Well, if we set ourselves up to think of ourselves as heroes, right? If we, if we have that mindset, we're more likely to act in a heroic way if the situation arises where being a hero becomes necessary. I think that that's just terrific. So, so listeners, do like Tim and me are going to try to do right here. Imagine yourself as a hero. Put a cape on your back. Visualize yourself standing up for the small guy making the hard decision at work to call it a wrong, even, even if it means that your boss or someone else is going to be mad at you. And if we all work at becoming heroes, if we all take this mindset on, that if we all take this time to really imagine what being a hero is and how we should act in these situations, we can make the world a better place. <laughs> So with that, Groovers, we hope you enjoyed the show. 
we hope that you learned a little bit more about how context matters. And hopefully, you will be our hero and share this episode with others. With that, we wish you well and hope that this week you go out and find your groove.